This is coverage of the Hog Commodity Meeting at the 1980 National Farmers Organization Convention in Cincinnati, Ohio. And now here's Merle Sunken, Director of the Hog Division. Our program this morning will start and I will take the first part of it here. I'm going to open it with some statistics here that are from the USDA out of Washington office. I have a slide presentation here that's going to take a few moments. It may seem a little bit boring, but there's some very, very good points that I think we need to be discussing on the grain yield factors, the carcass hogs, and the live merit bases. We're going to show you how to probe back fat on live hogs. After that, I'm going to go into a very positive part of the program. I'll be turning it over to Wayne Leedy. We'll be going into a pork peck presentation, just like we're using on the road at this time. And Wayne will show you and show us all how to handle the large hog producers and tie them in with the block of collection points that we're presently moving to make a total program for every hog producer throughout the United States. Then after Wayne gets through with his presentation, I'll be coming back and summarizing and giving you the goals of the hog division for 1980 and 1981. So with that kind of an introduction, I will go ahead and begin a slide presentation if the bulbs hold out. So Keith, would you catch the lights? Right there, Keith. Uh, if you would open up two back doors, Keith, please. The first one here will be talking about the USDA swine and pork grades. Uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture, of course, their address, and this comes from the meat board of the National Livestock and Meat Board. Uh, the first picture here of the hogs is very insignificant in this picture, except for the fact that these hogs have just been unloaded from a semi. They're in a holding pen, just being ready to go into a slaughtering plant. The reason that this picture is in here is because of the water spray that you see in the background at these hogs are being cooled and because they do kill out best and keeps down various types of uh, problems in the kill floors. And so the reason this picture is, it's a hot day. The hogs are being settled down. Uh, they're being cooled out before they go on to the kill floors. The uh, <coughs> expected yield of the four lean cuts are based on the chilled carcass weights by grades. In other words, your four primal cuts on your hogs, of course, are your hams, your loins, your picnecks, and your Boston butts. Uh, your five primal cuts, of course, is the other one would be the belly that is not shown in this particular situation. Your number one hogs, as far as the USDA is concerned, the four primal cuts should have a cutability of 53% or over. The number two hogs should have a 50 to 52.9 uh, primal cuts, the number three hog of 47 to 47.9, and the number four hog normally has less than 47%. This is what the USDA uh, recommends for their primal cuts. This hog here, as you see, is just a, they're measuring the total length of the carcass. The carcass length on this hog is showed from the last, which be the H bone up there by the ham. They call that little red spot there where the pelvic bone you might uh, recognize a little more easily would be split, and that is called the H-bone, down uh, at the front of the hog to the first rib. And that is where they, uh, on a certify, uh, to certify a, a breeding herd and so forth, uh, that has to be a length of 29 inches or better. This here just shows it's a graft uh, as far as the uh, USDA is concerned. This is the average thickness of 
back fat runs along this line here. This scale here is the length of the loin. Just for an example, a number one hog with a 30, 30 inch loin can have as much as 1.4 back fat measurements. So it is possible to have a uh, maybe a 260 or 70, 80 pound hog with a 33 inch loin and he could carry as high as an inch and a half of back fat measurement according to the USDA standards. These are just five carcasses showing hanging in a cooler. Uh, on this side on your left hand, on your left hand side would be a number one hog, the second's a number two, three, four, and the last one of course is a utility hog which is kind of a meatless wonder and that's what we're going to be going into right now. Your number one hog here you can see at the ham has a nice round full ham, very uh, thin layer of fat cover over it and a nice round bulge up there. Uh, down along the back, he has a very trim uh, back fat measurement there, probably an inch, an inch point one or two. He has a beautiful length there, probably a 31 to 32 inch uh, loin in him. Uh, he has a lot of good meat in his, his shoulders, which would be your picnics and your Boston butt area. You see a lot of, of good red uh, meat there in the bellies on him. The number two hog is approximately the same, maybe an inch shorter in the length. He has a lot of nice round covering on his on the, the ham at the top. Uh, the back fat is just a hair bit bigger, but as you go into the number three hog here, you see that the back fat is getting uh, considerably wider. Uh, there's not much uh, uh, round or muscle there in the ham, and as you see, you just see a lot more white, uh, which is large, you might say, all the way through this hog, and as you go to the number four hog, he's a very, uh, you've lost a lot of the length in this hog. He's a much shorter hog, a lot of greasy back fat cover there. Uh, there's not hardly any muscle in the, in the loin. And I mean, as far as the uh, ham is concerned, uh, the loin has probably a very small loin eye, uh, probably a three to 3.2 or three inch loin eye in it, and not the five inch loin eye that you probably see in that number one hog that we just went through. This is again just a picture of a group of hogs getting ready to be slaughtered on a kill floor. You see they're wet, they're being cooled down, settled down before they go on to the kill floor. We go into the live hog here, the number USDA uh, has said for many years this is the type of hog we want. Uh, he's got a beautiful length to him and he has a nice trim, uh, slim body to him. Uh, he has beautiful hams on him. He's standing wide in one way. He can look at a hog to see if he's got a lot of nice muscle in his, his rear end or in his hams, and that is look at his back legs, see how far his back legs are standing apart uh, as you're looking at him from the rear view mirror. And uh, so as you look down across the top of that hog, he's got everything, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, that is not necessarily what the packing industry is looking for today uh, as far as hogs are concerned. This number two hog, uh, in our opinion, and uh, throughout the industry is really what the packer is looking for. It's another, it's a hog here that uh, the only difference between this hog and the number one uh, is the mostly in the belly. You see there's quite a bit more belly to this hog. Uh, he's still standing nice and wide apart. He has a nice bulge in the hams. He has nice cover across the back. He has a, a thin uh, cover of, of of lard across his back. Uh, he's got nice trim jowls, but he's just a little bit thicker through the belly than your number one hog is, and that is what the Packers are looking for today would be that hog right there. As we go to the number three hog, uh, well, he's just lacking a little bit of everything. He's shortened up quite a little bit. You see his back legs there are uh, close together. Uh, you don't see any bulge in the hams at all. Uh, up over the top of his shoulders there, you can just see uh, his, his shoulders are carrying a lot of fat. And as you go into this, well, I don't think I even have to explain that one to you. We just don't raise those anymore. Nobody has that kind of hog. Everybody says so. Well, as you see there, uh, his, his hams are even sagging. You know, when you see a sagging ham, that's got to be fat. It's lard. It's grease. It's not a muscle. There's no red meat in that hog's ham at all. Uh, just a gobby bunch of lard all the way through. He's very wasty in the belly, uh, very wasty across the back. Uh, the jaws are sloppy, just a very undesirable hog. Well now, ladies and gentlemen, that's a meatless wonder. That's a cat ham. That's a hog today that most of the people in the confinement units and the confinement areas uh, 
If that pig lives to be a week old, most of them knock him in the head because that, uh, and it costs just as much, ladies and gentlemen, to have that hog killed at 200 pounds in a packing plant and it did the nice number one meat type hog that we just passed a few moments ago. This here is feeder pigs. Now I'm going to show you those same four animals uh, as feeder pigs. <coughs> this number two hog that I said the packing industry wanted today was the number one pig when he was a baby. Uh, he grew up to be the number two hog as far as USDA is concerned, but as far as the packing industry is concerned, and possibly myself or the organization, uh, we're calling him the number one hog all the way through because we think he's the hog that the packing industry wanted. The other pig here that turned out to be the number one pig uh, was number two when he was a small one, the same way that the three and four pig was turned around. Uh, but you can see this pig here, he didn't have much when he was younger and he got less as he grew up. Well, that is not the same pig because he changed color, but it's one must have been the other litter mate. Oh, that's a, that's a pretty one. All right, now we're going to talk just for a, a few moments here about swine evaluation, and it's a live and on the carcass merit. We're going to be talking about two hogs here. One hog will be a large spotted hog, and the other one will be a hamp hog, and the significant difference here is the hamp hog, uh, as we go through here, you'll find out he has a 155 pound carcass, and the other hog will have a 190 pound carcass. Uh, the heavy hog, as we see here, is very wide, very undesirable, short in length, uh, not much to him at all, where the hamp hog, in this case, the one on your left-hand side has a nice rounding hams, a uh, nice length in the loin, he's good across the shoulders, and he stands right. The spotted hog on your right is uh, very wasty in the jowls in this picture. Uh, the hamp hog is very smooth and trim, and what we're going to be seeing here is, uh, all right, one more picture here of the heavy hog, uh, very short, very undesirable, real wasty in the belly, no hams, a sagging ham back there, which means lard, very wasty in the jaws and extremely short. Uh, look at the legs on this hog. They're standing you know, within an inch of each other in the back, so you know there can't be any muscle there. There can't be any red meat in this hog. It has to be pretty well just a uh, gob of lard. This hog here is a trim hog. This picture here is not uh, appreciative of the hog itself because he is showing here in this picture he's short. Uh, which is not right. Uh, this picture has not been taken to be a true picture of that particular hog. Uh, the hog here is standing up. He's got some nice rounds in the, the hams. He's straight across the, the, the shoulder, I mean the hams up across his back. He's standing a little wider apart, but still again, this is not, uh, in my opinion, uh, the, the kind of a picture, the kind of ham that we really wanted to see on this type of a hog. Uh, here the hogs are, have been killed, they have been uh, in whole, and they just gutted out, uh, they're frozen, they're frozen solid, and now we're going to take these hogs from their tails to their noses and cut them up an inch at a time. I've taken out a lot of these slides in this uh, as far as shortening up the film is concerned uh, for our purpose here today, but we are going to slice these hogs up an inch at a time, taking from the tail and going up through the hog looking at them, and here's the first slice off the tail. The second slice here shows you that the heavy hog is carrying with this mark here. As we go through the slides, you look at this mark here real carefully, and you'll see that's where they're measuring the back fat on the two particular hogs on this film. The heavy hog, uh, the 190-pound carcass, is carrying three and a half inches of back fat, and the other hog is carrying two inches. In this picture here, you're seeing one carrying three inches and the other one's carrying only an inch and a half. Uh, don't worry about the color and the hams because remember these two hogs were frozen. They were cut up with a, a band saw. They were sliced with a saw. And so you have uh, meat and saw bones on the pictures here. So if the coloration, uh, don't worry about the coloration of the pictures. 
Here we're still carrying uh, uh, right down through the hams of this hog, we're still carrying two inches of back fat on the one compared to 0.8% on the good muscled meaty type hog and look at the meat in that ham. All right, we're just leaving the ham area. We're going on up through the hog. We're carrying another inch, 0.6 to 0.6 inches of back fat. Uh, it's just unbelievable the amount of uh, difference there are in these two particular hogs as we go through them. We'll soon be into the loin eye area. In this hog, we're at the last uh, lumbar vertebrae in the hog, and we're carrying a 1.8 inches of back fat compared to the 1.1 inch of back fat. All right, here is your first loin eye measurement from the back of the hog. You have a 3.8 uh, square inch loin eye uh, and a one and a six uh, inches of back fat. On the number one hog over there, you have 4.8 inches square uh, inches of loin eye and only 0.9 inches of back fat. Here we have a significant difference of 3.9 inches loin eye compared to a 5.1 inches. Again, you have a 3.9 to 5.1. But look at here, as we go through the belly area of this hog, look at the difference in the, the, the lean red edible meat and the difference in these two hogs. And it'll be a bigger significant difference as we continue to work up through the middle of this hog. This is at the last rib of the hog, and you can already see the difference in the size of the loins and also in the bacons as you work up through them. You have three and a half inch square inches of loin eye compared to a five square inches of loin eye, and uh, that makes a pretty good difference on your pork chop if you had that on your plate. You got another, you know, you got an inch and a half more uh, pork chop on the one than the other one. But there, I think, is a real picture of your bacon. You know, as you ladies uh, go into the stores, you know, which one of these bacons would you pick up? Uh, here again, a very significant difference, an inch and a half difference in the loin, the loin eye on that hog. Here's at the tenth rib. We're still seeing an uh, inch, inch four difference in the loin eye. Now you're up to the last rib, going into the shoulders of the hog, standing up. Remember, these hogs are standing up, they're froze. They've been sliced up an inch at a time. All right, the significant thing I wanted to show you with that, and I have one more slide here to go through. The thing I wanted to show you on that is the fact that the heavy hog had 190 pounds carcass and the light hog had a 155 pound carcass. The 155 pound carcass had 89 pounds of red edible meat in it. The 190 pound carcass only had 82 pounds of red edible meat. 45 pounds heavier carcass and seven pounds less meat. And we wonder as producers why they have to cut that 270 pound hog out away from the 220 pound hogs when you bring them into the collection point or the hog buying station or the sale barn or terminal yard, wherever you sell them. Well, that's one reason. That's not always the case because there's a lot of 270 pound hogs has a lot better carcass than the one we just looked at. I agree with that. This one here I'm going to run through very fast for you because of the time that we're taking here. This is the uh, measuring the uh, meat quality on the uh, hoof and also on the rail. Uh, if you're uh, measuring on a, live, on a live hog, if you're going to probe for back fat measurements, you'll do it at the first rib in the center of the hog and also at the last lumbar vertebrae. You'll do it about two inches off from the center of the hog's back if you don't have a a ruler or measuring stick, lay your two fingers down there and you're pretty accurate uh, off from the center of the hog's back. 
Uh, the two things you'll be using to measure the back fat measurement, of course, is a knife here that you'll have to, should wrap with tape to make sure the incision is not too deep in the hog's back, and this is a metal uh, probe or metal uh, ruler uh, to do the actual measuring with. In this picture here, you see that they have taken and sliced the, the, the center of the back of the hog or through the hide there across the hog and not lengthways because of afraid of getting in the metal ruler into the uh, muscle tissues uh, or in, the, in between the muscles of the hog. So if you go crossways, you won't be quite as apt to go in between the muscle tissues. This is the electric, electric probe that they do it electronically with. And you see here is the end of it, just a needle that is stuck in the hog's back. It doesn't really hurt the hog. It's no more than giving him a, a vaccination type situation. Here you see it's actually being done in the center of the back, offsetting about two inches from the, the middle of the hog. Here is the measurements that was taken at the last lumbar vertebrae and in the center, of course, at the last rib and at the front at the beginning of the first rib. The, uh, here again you see the H-bone back at the back in the, uh, the, to get the overall carcass length and for certification it has to be the minimum of 29 inches. Uh, you can just actually take a, st a steel ruler or a, a measuring stick here and measure the actual length of the carcass. There's just a picture of the loin. We're going to show you now how uh, they actually do the uh, measuring of that loin eye. We're talking about the loin eye and of course that is this portion of the meat right here. We're not talking about the bone. We're not talking about the fat. We're talking about the, the actual marbling and the muscling of the loin itself. <laughs> this here, uh, the lines here are taken from the 10th and 11th rib. Uh, they actually take a black pen, they draw a black mark around the loin, they trace that on a piece of uh, a paper, and they take and do the actual measuring here, and that is, I believe they call it a plenometer, I believe, that they take and do the actual measuring of it, and as this goes around the circle, it actually measures the exact uh, distance around the loin eye in every measurement. You can put that graft on a, a sheet of paper here, and to get the loin eye measurements, you take like uh, this here is a, a third or a tenth here, this is a tenth, and maybe this here is seven eighths, and then they actually figure it up to exactly how much, many inches of loin eye there has been in this particular hog. If you'd give me the lights, please. Wayne, would you shut the back of that off? <clears throat> okay, that uh, finishes up my intelligence on uh, cutability of hogs. Uh, Roger Blank from the home office that has about 28 years of experience with Wilson and Company uh, helped put those slides there together. Uh, they was purchased from, uh, uh, he helped me put them together in that uh, sequence and explained to me what some of those things were because I'm not all that familiar with all the details of them. Uh, but they were purchased from the University of Illinois and also from uh, Washington, the USDA out of Washington. At this time, I'm going to turn the program over to Wayne Leedy and he's going to be spending a few moments with us now going into our pork pack program and showing us how we're going to tie the large hog producers of the, and the future hog producers of this nation with uh, the ones at our collection points and throughout the country. But before he does that, I want to show you the reason that we as the NFO or as the hog division must change our ideas and of what we have been thinking in the past years. I'm going to read you just a very few statistics here and if you would, I'd like for you to write them down because these are, have been uh, received from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington, D.C. This as, is as of December 1, 1979. These figures are one year old. At that time, we had 639,050 hog producers in this nation. 639,050 people. Seventy six point eight percent of these operations raise from one hog to ninety nine head. This represents sixteen point six percent of the hogs. 
19% of these operators produce from 100 head to 490, 449 head of hogs per year. This represents 43% of all the hogs raised in this nation. Now hold on to your seats, ladies and gentlemen, because there are 4.2% of these producers that produce 40.4% of the hogs in this nation. And if you was to take 3.6% of the largest hog producers in this nation, they would raise 37.4%. What does that mean to us? Let me make it real simple for you. Be somewhere between 25 and 26,000 hog producers control approximately 41% of all the hogs in this nation. Most of you sitting in this room have been to NFO conventions where we've had 25,000 people. So if you can imagine that convention you was to that had 25,000 people or the last football game you were to that had 25,000 people in it, that amount of people control 40% or 41% of all the hogs in this nation. Those are the people that will control the destiny of the hog industry. So at this point, I'm going to turn the program over to Wayne Leedy. Uh, which has came to the organization about two and a half years ago. He came from Marhofer Packing Company, Muncie, Indiana. He has a tremendous amount of ability with the packing industry. He has a tremendous amount of, of background in livestock, and he's a super PR man, and that's what I like about him. All right, thank you much. I want to spend uh, a few minutes now at the start of... Uh, the pork pack presentation to bring a couple things into your mind. One of the things is that pork pack is not necessarily a new idea because the oil countries thought of it first. Remember that. They thought of it first and they managed to raise the price of our energy double it or more in the last two years. I like to tell this little story because it's the reason that pork pack happened, it's the reason that this organization has existed for 25 years, and it's a real simple thing. The guy from the OPEC Oil Nations explained why they raised the price of energy. He said it's simple. In 1954 I sold oil for 12 cents a barrel to Standard Oil of America, and they got $23 a barrel for it. Today the price of oil is still $23 a barrel, only I get the money. That's been the philosophy of this organization from its onset. There's no reason for anybody in this room to think that the goals and the ideals of the National Farmers Organization should ever waver one little bit from where they've been all these years. Because what we're talking about today is a thing called pork peck. And that program is the method by which the pork industry, we the pork industry, price our product, put ourselves in a profit position, and provide food at a reasonable cost for people in this country and around the world. And I said, we, the pork industry, I guess I should explain that. Because when I stand here and talk to people about pork peck, we're talking about the pork industry. We're talking about all the people that are involved in pork. We, the pork industry. The hog producer who provides the raw material and the financial stability for the pork industry the killer and the processor who provides goods and services at a cost for the pork industry, the retailer who provides the seller's market for us at this time, and those people that promote pork and help us keep up front our product and do our advertising for us. That is we, the pork industry. That's what pork peck's about. 
the variables in pork peck are so many that there's no limit to what we can do with it and what will happen with it because it's being very well accepted at all levels in the pork industry. We the pork industry. I want to talk a little now about pork peck. I'm going to do this demonstration and do it very similar to what we would do if we were going out to a large producer or a small producer and discuss with them the National Farmers Pork Peck Program. You see, we go out and we say to the people, and this is a good business proposition because what we're talking about, ladies and gentlemen, is the thousand largest hog producers in this country, the thousand largest, now remember the figures that Mr. Sunken gave you a moment ago, what we're talking about, because we're talking about the thousand largest hog producers in this country along with the 200 already existing country points. That's the system that this organization built and designed over the years, the successful system. We want that thousand large hog producers participating in our program, in their program, in your program, but we want those people participating in this program for two reasons. First and foremost, as we know from years of experience, the numbers create the power block, give us the leverage and the volume that's necessary to block, negotiate, and deliver, and have some leverage. And we say we've converted that into economic power and negotiations with that particular thing, with the volume alone. Now I say to the hog producers, and I say to you people, one other thing that doesn't show up here on this chart, and it's a very important thing, and we should talk about it. We should talk about it a lot in the coming months. In addition to the volume from the 200 collection points and the 1,000 or the 1,000 largest hog producers in this country, in addition to that volume, we get something else, something that's equally important, equally vital to each of us, and our successful efforts to cause our own pricing structures. And that is the input of management people, proven successful people, both here and here, at both levels, their ability to come together and have successful input and experience in their brains. We want their knowledge. And that is so real and so necessary in this program that it really needs to be talked about. Because we want each of you, we want your knowledge, we want your abilities, we want the things that you know are proven and successful. We want your ability to think through problems and solve them. We want also from the thousand largest hog producers in that country, in this country, that same response. The two things that we receive from our producers when we do this, their volume, which gives us the ability to convert a power base into economic power for negotiations, is important. That's the main thing. But equally important is their ability to think, solve problems, participate in our program, and assist us as a group in being successful. And it's important. It doesn't show up on here, but we got to talk about it. Now we say to these people that after we have put together the power base of this size and dimension. I like to say to them that when you do this and we go into negotiations, you cause your own pricing structure. Well, what does that mean? 
Does that mean that at that time we reached cost of production plus a reasonable profit? Not necessarily. I don't think we should mislead anybody and say, you know, boy, that's the answer. We got it done. No, that's not right. That's not necessarily so. What that says is that we have caused through the power of our volume and our ability to block and negotiate production together, we have caused an upward pressure on the market that is a real and visible thing. Now we know from experience in this organization that blocking together, selling in blocks and negotiating for those blocks, we can and do create upward pressure on the market. So we cause our own pricing structure by bringing together upward pressure on the market. Then we like to say, and I like to say to the people next, then we learn to adjust our own systems to stay up with the future, which simply means that we make use of the knowledge and ability of ourselves as a group and the technical people that we have within the organization to do with our own particular systems those things that will benefit us as individuals on down the line. And being successful at these two things, we then can, and this is important, because we then can comfortably become contractible over long periods of time. We can comfortably do that, exercising our ability to cause a market structure, being able to adjust each of our individual systems to our wants and needs, then we can be become very comfortable and become contractible over long periods of time. And of course the key to this program is the profitable delivery. That's what it's all about. To sell something for more money than it costs you to produce it. That's what we're talking about. And we say that a profitable delivery is orderly marketing at a price level where both parties make a margin. Why do we discuss both parties? Because we're talking about we the pork industry. And we are the pork industry. A contract is only a piece of paper or an agreement between two people by which both feel that they have profited. That's all it is. So both parties includes the person and or persons who bought the hogs. The guy that paid for them. He's got to make a living. And you know why he's got to make a living? And why he's part of the pork industry? Because at the present rate, we're losing approximately, give or take a little, 50 packing houses a year. Right across this country. We've got the hogs, the basic number of hogs in this country in... 25,000 hands, uh, according to Mr. Sunken's figures. What good would it do us if we had the kill plants all in the hands of two people? Then where would we be? So, by necessity and by reality, we, the pork industry, and both parties must make a margin. That has to be real. We have to be business enough and intelligent enough to protect those people in the industry, in the pork industry, who are necessary for us to achieve our goals. Now, I normally go through that and then I go into the long-term benefits of the program and I call this the long-term benefits of the program because these are the things that actually are happening in the overall picture in the pork peck program first of all by joining pork peck today the following are available to you you or your market manager have the option to participate in our program which market-wise should be equal to or better than your present market. 
The key to that statement is this, and it's a very vital key because it's uh, kind of important that we look at that for just a minute. The key to that statement is the word option. We, the National Farmers Organization, are selling an option to participate in our program. We make a good business deal because we said price-wise it should be equal to or better than your present market structure, and it should be. That option in the new National Farmers Organization has been a winner. I find no people, zero people, that doesn't agree with the philosophy of this hog division and with this organization. Zero people that don't agree with the philosophy. So therefore, we've offered them an option. We're being very successful with the option, doing real well with it. And by joining today and participating, we can realize more profit money and fringe benefits. How many of us in this room spend the time to talk to somebody about the fringe benefits of this organization? You know, I don't do it like I should because I don't always think about the fringe benefits of this organization. I've worked around here a couple years or two and a half years and I've got like you guys, the fringe benefits are automatic. I didn't notice they were fringes anymore. But they're there. They're saleable items to your neighbors and they're important to people so we got to keep talking about them. We got to discuss the fringes, whatever they might be. We got to keep going with that thing. Now with Pork Peck you can expand your marketing ability and become more profitable by using your professional staff to achieve your personal goals. What are we saying to the people here? What are we saying to you? What are we saying to the large hog producer? To the businessman in the pork industry? What are we saying to them? We're saying with Pork Peck you can expand your ability because you have hired a professional marketing group to help you market your product. And it's still your product. We've asked you to do it because you want to achieve your personal goals. Now everybody relates to their own personal situation and their own problems and their own goals and ideas. And this thing is so important and so critical when you make this presentation or when you talk to people about this program, this is a critical thing. <coughs> because no two people in this room do exactly the same type of operation. No two people producing five to 200,000 hogs a year do it exactly the same way. So we're talking about personal goals. Pork Peck enables you to participate in all the good things and still achieve your personal goals because you have hired a professional staff of people that are available to you to expand your own abilities and to achieve your personal things. And that's important because we do, among all other things, we must maintain the individuality of the American farmer regardless of the size of operation he runs. And this program provides that feature. By participating in Pork Peck, you have joined with the leadership of the pork industry. This makes you a part of the largest and most efficient group of food producers ever put together. What are we saying? We're saying basically, first of all, that by participating in Pork Peck, you have joined with the leadership. This is the leadership of the pork industry in this room. 
This is the marketing leadership in agriculture. Whether you like it or not, as members of the National Farmers Organization, you have to accept that responsibility because you are leaders and you are the leadership of marketing. By joining Pork Pack today, these people who are coming into the program are joining with the leadership of the pork industry. We do have, within the power base that I just described previously, the largest block of food that's ever been put together anywhere in the world. With the thousand largest hog producers in this country and the 200 collection points that we've already got in operation, turns out to be the largest block of food that's ever been put together. It has to be a winner, ladies and gentlemen, because it's right.